A few days ago, a pro member shared a website that I had never come across before. As soon as I opened it, I was blown away by the first experience. It was so captivating that I didn't even feel like exploring the rest of the site. The standout feature was this incredibly cool image gallery with a lens distortion effect that had chromatic aberration. You can see it also follows the cursor and distorts the underlying images in such a cool way. Initially, I brainstormed a few possible techniques for how this effect might have been achieved. One idea was using a 3D transparent model with built-in chromatic aberration while the other was leveraging shaders. After some digging, I couldn't find any pre-made 3D model so I turned to Shader Toy and found a shader that was perfect for building a similar effect. I'll include the link to that shader in the description for you to check out. Now, while the original website's implementation is way more polished and professional, I was able to create a basic yet functional version of it using the shader I found. In this video, I'll walk you through how to add this stunning distortion effect to an image gallery using HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and WebGL shaders. We'll also create a smooth pan animation for the gallery that dynamically follows your cursor while maintaining that lens distortion effect. If you find my work helpful, dropping a like would mean a lot. It helps the video reach more people and supports the channel's growth. And if you'd like to access the source code, it's available through the pro membership. The link is in the description. Alright, let's dive into the code. For the HTML, we are keeping it minimal since most of the functionality will be handled using JavaScript. First, I've added a div with the class name viewport and inside it, I've included another div with the class name container. This container will hold all the images and will hide the overflow on the viewport to set up the pan animation effect. Lastly, there is a canvas element added outside the viewport structure. This is where we'll apply the lens distortion effect. And that's all we need for the HTML. Now let's move on to the styling. We'll start by resetting the default styles, setting the margin and padding to zero and setting box sizing to border box. Next, for the viewport, we'll make it cover the entire screen by fixing its position and setting its width and height to 100 viewport width and 100 viewport height. We'll also hide any overflow so that the pan animation stays confined within this area. The container inside the viewport is styled to span twice the width and height of the viewport. We'll create a grid layout for the images which automatically adjusts with a column width of 100 pixels. We have added some spacing between the grid items with a cap of 4 pixels and applied a transform property to handle the pan animation smoothly. The will change is set to transform to ensure optimal performance during animations. Each image will be wrapped in a div with the class image wrapper. Overflow is set to hidden to prevent anything from spilling outside the wrapper. For the images themselves, they are absolutely positioned to fill their parent container with object fit set to cover ensuring they maintain the correct aspect ratio while filling the available space. Finally, we have styled the canvas element for the lens distortion effect. It's fixed to cover the full viewport, set pointer events to none so it doesn't interfere with interactions and given a high Z index to ensure it stays on top of everything else. And that's the styling. Before we jump into the JavaScript, let me show you the shader I found on Shader Toy. It creates a distortion effect that's very similar to what we saw on the original website. Of course, I had to tweak it a bit to make it look even closer to the original. Since I have no experience at writing shaders, I used ChatGPT to handle some of the math and make the necessary adjustments and somehow made it work. For the project setup, I've created a folder named shaders and added two files inside it, one for the vertex shader and the other for the fragment shader. These files will handle the heavy lifting for the distortion effect. Now that everything is in place, let's dive into the JavaScript and start building. First, we need to grab the container element for our HTML. This is where all the images will go. Next, we'll set up some variables to track the mouse position and other states. Mouse X and Mouse Y will start in the center of the screen. Target Mouse X and Target Mouse Y will hold the position we want to move toward. We'll also define texture, which we'll use later for WebGL Canvas, and a few variables to control the animation of the container. Target X, Target Y, Current X and Current Y. Now let's set up an array of image sources. To generate these file names dynamically, we are using the from method from array. 
Next, we need a helper function called getRandomImage. This will randomly pick an image from our list and return its path. To build the grid, we'll create another function called createImageGrid. This function loops 300 times to create 300 images. For each image, we'll create a wrapper div with the class image wrapper. Then, we create an image element, set its source to a random image using getRandomImage function and set its alt text to grid item. Finally, we add the image inside the wrapper and append the wrapper to the container. This will generate our entire grid of images dynamically. Next, we'll move on to handling the pan animation and adding interactivity. First, we have the update pan function. This function calculates how far the container should move based on the mouse position. We start by finding the maximum possible movement for the container in both the x and y directions. Then we calculate the target positions, target x and target y, by mapping the mouse position to the movement range of the container. We use a factor of 0.75 to slow down the movement slightly and make it feel smoother. Next, we have the animate pan function. This function makes the container move towards the target position smoothly. We use a simple easing formula. The current x and current y values gradually move closer to target x and target y with each frame. Finally, we apply the calculated values to the container's transform property to move it. The translate function shifts the container in both the x and y directions. To keep the animation running continuously, we use request animation frame to call animate pan repeatedly. Now let's set up WebGL for our canvas to render the shader effects. First, we grab the canvas element from the HTML and get its WebGL rendering context by calling getContext method. We also pass in some options like preserve drawing buffer, anti-alias, and alpha to improve the rendering quality and transparency. Next, we have the setup WebGL function. This function configures WebGL to handle blending, which allows us to properly combine layers with transparency. We enable blending and specify how blending should work. After that, we have the create shader function. First, we create a new shader using create shader function. Then, we load the source code into the shader using shader source function. Next, we compile the shader with compile shader method. After compilation, we check if it is was successful. If there is an error, we log it using the get shader info log function and delete the faulty shader. If everything is fine, we return the compiled shader. Finally, we have the load shaders function, which loads the vertex and fragment shader source code asynchronously. Using fetch, we retrieve the shader files from the shaders folder and with promise, we ensure both shaders are loaded before proceeding. Once the files are fetched, we convert their contents to text using text method and return the shader sources. This setup ensures that we are ready to render the distortion effect on the canvas with shaders. Next, we'll move on to using the shaders in WebGL to bring the effect to life. Now let's initialize WebGL and set everything up. First, we call setup WebGL to enable blending, which lets us handle transparency in the rendering. Next, we use load shaders function to fetch the vertex and fragment shaders source code, then compile them using create shader. After that, we create a WebGL program, attach the shaders, and link them together. Once linked, we activate the program with useProgram method. Now, we define a set of vertices that form a rectangle covering the entire screen. We create a buffer to store these vertices, bind it, and send the vertex data to the GPU. Then we link this data to a position attribute in the shader so it knows where to draw. Next, we set up a texture. This texture will hold the image data we'll be using for the distortion effect. We bind the texture and link it to a uniform in the shader, which connects it to the program. With everything in place, our WebGL setup is complete. Next, we'll update the texture dynamically and render the effect on the canvas.
The update texture function is responsible for updating the WebGL texture dynamically based on the current state of the image grid. We start by creating a temporary canvas that serves as a drawing surface. Its dimensions are scaled by a factor of 4 to ensure high resolution, making the visual crisp even with zoom or transformations. We then get its 2D context for drawing and enable image smoothing with high quality. The background of the canvas is filled with white to create a clean base for drawing. Next, we calculate the container's current position and transformations. Using getBoundingClientRect function, we get the container's dimensions relative to the viewport and with getComputedStyle, we extract the transformation matrix applied to the container. This matrix is essential for aligning the temporary canvas with the transformed grid. We apply transformation to the temporary canvas using set transform, which ensures that the grid images are drawn in their proper positions. After this, we loop through all the images in the grid. For each image, we calculate its position relative to the container and draw it onto the temporary canvas using draw image. This step ensures every image is captured accurately in the transform state. Once all images are drawn, we reset the canvas transformation back to the default to prevent any further unintended transformations. The temporary canvas is then bound to the WebGL texture using bind texture function. We upload the canvas data to the WebGL program using text image 2D function, ensuring the texture always reflects the current view of the image grid. Finally, we configure the text properties, setting min filter and mac filter to linear for smooth scaling and using clamp to edge to avoid repeating patterns along the edges. This process ensures the WebGL texture is updated dynamically and reflects changes in the grid, allowing the distortion effect to remain responsive and accurate. The render function is where the actual drawing happens, and it continuously updates the canvas for smooth animations. First, we use an easing formula to gradually move the mouse x and mouse y values toward target mouse x and target mouse y. This creates a smooth animation effect when the cursor moves. Next, we set the canvas size to match the current window dimensions. The WebGL viewport is updated to cover the entire canvas using viewport. Then we call update texture to redraw the image grid onto the texture, ensuring it reflects the latest state of the grid. After that, we retrieve the uniform locations for eye resolution and eye mouse from the shader program. The resolution uniform tells the shader the size of the canvas, while the mouse passes the mouse position for the distortion effect. These values are updated later. Finally, we draw the rectangle using draw arrays function and request animation frame ensures the render function is called continuously to create a seamless animation loop. In the setup event listeners function, we add interactivity. First, we listen for mouse move events to track the cursor's position. When the mouse moves, we update the target mouse X and target mouse Y with the cursor's coordinates and call update pan to adjust the grid's position. We also listen for the resize events to handle changes in the browser window size. When the window resizes, we update the canvas dimensions and reset the mouse and animation values to ensure everything scales correctly. Finally, the init function sets everything into motion. We start by calling create image grid to dynamically generate the grid of images. Next, we wait for the first image to load using a promise. This ensures the WebGL texture has valid image data to work with. Once the image is ready, we initialize WebGL by calling init WebGL. We then set up the event listeners for interactivity, start the pan animation with animate pan and kick off the rendering loop with render. The init function is called at the very end 
to bring all the pieces together initializing the grid shaders and animations and that's it hope you found the video helpful see you in the next one